at this time, we're, the, the, chill, the kids are going to go down to Sunday school with, with Miss Wendy. It was so funny, there was this one young man, he's kind of a, he's, I think he's a teenager now, but when he was little, he, he called Sunday school Wendy school. <laughs> because he was so used to Wendy being his Sunday school teacher. And, and you know, I just, uh, I love how kids see things. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget how one young man, and I won't mention his name because I won't embarrass him, but uh, when he was younger, he, he, you know, he pointed to me, he said, Dad, look, it's the man with the words. <laughs> That was so awesome. I was like, man, I could that, that was a compliment. That, that's like, yeah, the man with the words. You know, that's so I, I and it's just I just love the way kids look at things. It's it's just so humorous and so innocent and, yes. and so pure sometimes. Amen. All right, I want to welcome our YouTube friends in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. And I want us to turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to talk about a guarantee that has been given to us from God. You know, because we don't see God, because God's invisible, because Jesus Christ did his earthly ministry almost 2,000 years ago, none of us are 2,000 years old, we didn't see Jesus physically do the things that he did, but we believe. We believe that, that Jesus Christ walked on the water. We believe that, that Jesus Christ healed the sick. We believe that Jesus Christ raised the dead. We, we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. We believe that he rose again and ascended to the Father's throne. And we believe that he's coming back again. You know, it, it's, I know that those are somewhat the lyrics of, uh, of the Newsboys. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to plagiarize those. But they're so, so, such cool words. Um, but, but, but there's a guarantee that we have that I think sometimes maybe we don't fully um, grasp it or we, we believe it, but we believe it with, with trepidation, with, with, with an uncertainty, maybe with a, with, with a bit of fear. And, um, and so I want to I look at, at our guarantee and let's just invite God's spirit into our presence before we even read the passage. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we ask that your Holy Spirit would, would speak to us through this passage. That he would give us a, 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 a road, a path to travel. That Lord, I know that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, but sometimes, Father God, we become like black sheep. We, we, we lose our way, and you have to go into the thickets and, and pull us out, and, and you're so loving, and you're so, so gracious, and so kind, and, and so patient with us. And so, Father, help us, oh God, to, to be the people you want us to be, to do the things you want us to do, and, and may we do it not on our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, and not for our glory, but for your glory because we love you Lord Jesus and we are so grateful for what you did for us and we, we thank you for that in Jesus name Amen. Amen I want you to know that the guarantee that we have eternal life is the Holy Spirit living inside of us if you're a real Christian you just know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, there might be times in your life where you might doubt that a little bit, and that's where God's Word comes in, where Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Truly you are my disciples, if my words abide in you, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Couple that with Romans 8, 1 that says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Obviously, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we're walking in the Spirit. We're walking in faith. Because none of us had our physical eyes see Jesus rise from the dead. None of us have had our physical ears hear Jesus unless we've had a vision or a dream where Jesus specifically spoke to us. But I mean, we believe that he is the Son of God. Remember what John said about Jesus. He said in John chapter 1 that Jesus came to his own, the Jews, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe upon his name. It all stems with faith and belief in Jesus Christ. And I think what happens as we travel through life is, is, the, is the dirt of the world and, and the struggle of our own personal sin, sins kinds to gum up 
the, the gears and, and the vision of, of what God has called us to do. And we forget exactly who we are and what we are. Kind of like Simba, you know, in The Lion King where he was exhorted by his dad. Never forget who you are. Never forget who you are. We need to remember who we are in Christ Jesus. And so let's take a look at, uh, uh, at, the, at this passage. Um, we're going to see that, I believe in this passage, this passage will show us that, that the Christian has a destiny. That before we can see anything, we need to understand we have a destiny. Before, before anyone can have a vision, they need to know that they have a destiny. That's, that's the part of knowing who you are. But then what happens after we have that destiny? The Christian is then given sight. So we have a, the Christian destiny, the Christian sight, and then what does the Christian sight do? It gives them something to aim at, the Christian's aim. And so those are the main points of the sermon. The Christian's destiny, the Christian's sight, and the Christian's aim, because why? We have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So let's take, let's take a look at this passage in verse 1 of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust we are well known in your conscience, consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Amen. This is an incredible passage. Because this is a passage that we need to be well aware of. We need to know that we have a destiny. So many Christians live their lives, they get saved, and then they really don't have a plan. They don't really have a focus. They don't really understand that they're destined for something more than just this life. Okay? And in verse 1 it, it says, For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed we have been clothed, we shall also not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. And you might be saying, what is Paul talking about here? Tents and clothing and, and, and what's, what's going on. And so in verse 1, we're told that we have an earthly house. That earthly house is your physical body. That's the, the body we have right now. This is my earthly house. Your body is your earthly house. In this body, I yearn to be clothed with my glorified body. Okay? And I think that as you get older, and as you deal with more and more uh, medical issues, okay, when you're young and strong and vibrant, you may not uh, yearn for your glorified body as much as those who are older, 
But I do believe that if you're truly walking with God, there still is a part of you that goes, I can't wait to be with Jesus. <laughs> I can't wait to yet be clothed with my eternal body. Paul is saying that even if this body is destroyed, okay, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. That word habitation is the same Greek word that is used of the angels that left their eternal bodies to have physical bodies to copulate with human women in Genesis 6. Okay? It's the same word. Okay? Jude talks about, Jude uses the same word when he said the angels that left their first habitation. It's the exact same word. Those angelic beings went in reverse of what we want to do. They went from their heavenly habitation into an earthly habitation where we want to go from this earthly habitation into our heavenly habitation. And the, the Bible does tell us that, that you know, we should be um, friendly to strangers because we might be entertaining angels unaware. Okay? And, and I know this is a weird thing, and I know this is a hard thing for a lot of people to accept, but remember that we are spiritual beings first. That when we get saved, the Holy Spirit is poured into our spirit. And our spirit is thus sealed. And then our job is to take our soul and conform it to where our spirit is. Our soul being our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions. These are all areas of, of who we are as people that need to be brought under the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ. You see, our salvation is secure. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus saves us to the uttermost. And that's, that's a spiritual thing. But our, our, our soulish part, okay, our mind. See, that's why carnal Christians are called soulish Christians because they rule their Christian walk with their, their mind, their will, their intellect, and their emotions instead of allowing the Spirit of God to rule them with the mind of Christ, with the feelings of God, with the will of God, the intellect of God. You see, this is, in fact, this is the church that Paul wrote to that. He said, I wish I could speak to you as spiritual, but I cannot. I speak to you as carnal or soulish. Why? Because there was divisions in that church. How do you know a church is spiritual? You know the degree of spirituality in a church to the degree that we have unity and love for one another. The two greatest commandments are not nullified by what we think the behavior of others should be or, or what they should be doing, okay? The two greatest commandments are this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And upon these two commands rest the entire law and the prophets. There are a lot of Christians who are very concerned about the law of God being fulfilled. We will have the law of God fulfilled by George if we have to ram it down your throat, sit down on top of you, and spoon feed you whether you like it or not. And I want you to know something. That never accomplishes the will of God. You know why? Because it violates what James tells us. To be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I, I mixed that up, but, you know, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to, slow to anger. Why? Because the anger of man. See, when people start saying, we've got to follow the law of God, it's usually because they're angry about something. And the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Love does. God is love. You see, anger implies wrath. Wrath implies judgment. And we're not here to judge one another. We, we saw that last week. Romans 14.10 Why do you judge your brother? For you yourself are going to stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. 
Okay? You know, if, if I was a person that was, knew that I was going to stand before a judge to be judged about, and this judge is all-knowing, <laughs> all-powerful, can see right into my heart, knows everything I've ever done, okay? And I'm, and I'm making an inventory list of all the sins and all the bad attitudes and all the wrong, the wrong things in my life. And, 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 I'm, and I know that I'm going to stand before him and give him an account. Do you think I'm going to be saying, well, Chip, you know, well, I'm Chip did this and this and this. And this. Uh, well, you know, I might try that, but you know what God's going to say? We're not here to talk about Chip. We're here to talk about you. Because half of those things you just accused Chip of, you do yourself. Because that's what happens. I kid you not, the scriptures tell us that. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, it says, Brothers, you are spiritual. If you catch a brother in sin, restore him gently, lest you too be tempted in like manner. It never ceases to amaze me that oftentimes the people who are accusing other Christians of certain things end up doing the very things that they're accusing the Christian, their, their brothers and sisters of. I don't, I don't think that that's the job we want. Because the book of Revelation tells us, in Revelation chapter 12, that, it, that it's the job of Satan who goes before God day and night and accuses the brethren. Do you want to be working with the devil? I don't want to work with the devil. And I don't want to do the devil's work. I want to do God's work. And the ministry of God is love. Because in 1 Corinthians 13 it says, You can discern all prophecies. You can speak with the tongues of men and angels. You can give up your body to be burned. You can, you can spread the gospel. You can give, give food to the poor. But if you have not love, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. You know, and I think there are some Christians who are going to find out that the things that they saw, thought were so important in their ministries are absolutely nothing because they weren't doing it in love. They were doing it from some other motivation. I, I'm not going to accuse. I, I don't know. There can be all, God bless you. There can be all kinds of motivations. It might even be their fear. Maybe they're afraid of what others are going to... But, but again, how do we deal with that? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. We need to be using the scriptures. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds and taking captive every vain imagination and every evil thought and bringing it under the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ. That includes all the vain imaginations and evil thoughts that come from our own heart, from our flesh. Okay? And in case you've been real fleshly lately, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to remind you of 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm here to tell you that the mercy of the Lord is new every morning. You know, I'm here to tell you that, that, that Jesus has saved us to the uttermost. And, that, that, and, and, and to tell you that the scripture says that, that, that He can't deny us because we're His body. If we have the Spirit of God, we have, we're part of His body. Okay, so, so Paul is saying here, whoops, and if anyone, excuse me, had a reason to want to get out of his, present, his body, his earthly body, it was Paul. This poor guy was shipwrecked, he was stoned, he was whipped, he was beaten, he was left for dead several a couple of times. I mean, his body had scars. You know, I, you know <laughs> he, he probably had a lot of aches and pains in his body. And, but, but you know what, here's a thought, though. The believers who have died before us let me ask you this question. Do they have their resurrected bodies yet? The answer is no. We don't get the res our resurrected bodies until we're raptured. Until Jesus Christ comes back. Because remember what, what, what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us. Verses 13 through 18. Paul says, I would not that you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them which are asleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
getting their glorified bodies. I added that. Okay, getting their glorified bodies. And then, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Even so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, the dead in Christ are still waiting for their glorified bodies. Right now, you could basically say they're naked spirits in the presence of God. Okay? At least from our vantage point. Because eternity is different from time. You know? Because the entire church is going to get raptured all at the same time. Okay? And, and there, there, is a, 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 there is a pattern, you know. In 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that, that the physical body comes first and then the spiritual body. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, this is what Paul says to this very same church. He says, But I say this to you, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. For behold... I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. The, 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 the time difference between the dead in Christ getting their glorified body and the, and, the, and the alive in Christ getting their glorified body is a twinkle of an eye. Not the blink, but the twinkle. And there have been those who suggest that the smallest piece of time we know is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That's the smallest piece. That's, that's the quanta of, of the smallest piece of time. And then he goes on. He says, For this mortality must put on immortality. And this corruption must put on incorruption. So when this mortality has put on immortality, and when this corruption has put on incorruption, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death! is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't get the victory. Only Jesus can. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but then what do we do in the light of that? What would we do after the victory? You know, when your favorite sports team, football team, wins the Super Bowl, what do they do? They celebrate. And they become even more dedicated to the cause. We're going to repeat. We're going to win it again next year because this is awesome. And we should have that same attitude that we're going to continue this life thing because the last verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 50, 15, verses 50 through 58, is 58, where it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I know for a fact that every time I preach to you guys, every time I teach a Bible study, every time I love on someone with the love of God, every time I speak words of life from the Holy Spirit into another person, that it's not in vain. Amen. Ever. And it's not dependent upon the other person's response. It's not in vain. It's what God wants us to have a guarantee, a confidence, knowing that in spite of what, how bad it may look on the outside, it is well with my soul, the psalmist said. Okay? And, and, but, but, but Paul, going back here to 2 Corinthians, he doesn't deny the fact that we are still yearning for our heavenly habitation. I can't wait. I have Star Trek visions of my heavenly habitation. Okay? See, that's a good thing about being a Star Trek fan. It, it, well, some people think it bends your mind, but I think it stretches your mind to give you all kinds of possibilities that are, that are incredible. But the Christian's destiny is an eternal body and God's going to guarantee that we, he's going to keep us from eternal nakedness. And he's going to 
clothe us with light. How do we know? From the Word of God. Let's go back to the previous, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, the last three verses, verses 16, 17, and 18. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more excellent and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You can't take my eternal rewards away from me. You can't take my eternal reward away from me, I should say. And in fact, what ha the, the destiny of every believer in Jesus Christ is that we get raptured, right? And then we all stand before the beam of seat of Jesus Christ. And we have the works of our life tested by fire. See, we ourselves have passed from fire to life. Ourselves. But your works, not so. The things that you do in this body, as a believer in Jesus Christ, will be tested by fire. And we don't have time to go into 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You can go there yourself. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 10 through 23 talks about this, where every Christian's uh, work which is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, is going to be tested by fire. And there's going to be one of two results. Either your work's going to burn up and be like ash, or your work is going to pass through the fire and be like precious stones, silver, and gold. So there are some Christians that when we get raptured, we're going to be next to them and go, you smell a little bit like fire. What happened? <laughs> you know? And then there are going to be others like, I'll use, I love using this example, Billy Graham, okay? That brother is so precious to me because God has used his ministry, it's been estimated to leave between 200 and 225 million people into the kingdom of God. Amen. Wow. I think Billy Graham's going to have a whole lot of gold and silver that he can throw at the feet of Jesus Christ when he worships him in, all, in eternity. So that's the Christian's destiny, which should give us Christian sight. Okay, Look at me with, with me in 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. He says, Now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has also given us a spirit as a guarantee. What guarantee is that? Do you realize that when we stand before the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, you, we're going to be given crowns. Okay, the first crown is the imperishable crown. You know what that crown is for? That's a victor's crown. That's for those Christians who keep running the race in spite of the fact that their car is falling apart, their, their dog uh, doesn't love them, and they've lost all their money, and everything they touch turns to ruination, but they keep just believing on Jesus, and they keep just praising Jesus, and they just keep running the race. Or even for the average person, you're just going through, you know, you're, you're, you love Jesus, you're going through your life, you're raising your children, you're, you're working at your job, you're doing, you know, you're obeying the scripture, says whatever we find ourselves doing, let us do as unto the Lord and you just keep running and you keep running and you keep running and you keep running and you don't give up the Christians who don't give up are going to be given a crown it's called the imperishable crown then there's the crown of life I hope you don't have to get this one this is the martyr's crown because I don't want any of you guys to be killed okay but but those who've been killed for the cause of Christ they get the martyr's crown okay um, the, the next crown is the crown of glory this is the crown that is given to elders, people who feed the flock, people who, who teach Bible studies and, and preach and, and shepherd the little lammies that Jesus loves. A, a, a lot of pastors and a lot of, a lot of even lay leaders who do this. You don't have to be a pastor to shepherd the flock. You, you can be shepherding, shepherding a little flock of your own right in your home, your, your, hus your husband, your wife, your children your friends, your family. You know, there's a crown given to those who feed people the Word of God. Okay? Then there's the crown of righteousness. And you know how you get that crown? Just love His appearance. <laughs> Just be in love with Him coming back. That's an easy crown to get, I think. That's all. How good is our God? Actually, pretty much all these, other than the martyr's crown, I don't see a whole lot of sacrifice in getting these crowns. Okay, and then there's the crown of rejoicing. You know what the crown of rejoicing is given to? 
the soul winner. If you've ever led someone into the kingdom of God, that's your crown. Well, I only led one person way back in 1935. Well, actually, no, most of you couldn't do that. <laughs> Not even but. <laughs> All right, so it was 75 instead of 35. Okay. Guess what? Soul winner's crown. I think Billy Graham's probably going to have the biggest soul winner's crown, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I, you know. God measures things the, differently than we do. But, but the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of, of this rapture. Okay? Turn with me in your Bibles to, um, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, um, verses 12 through 17. I love this passage. Okay, Romans 12, I mean Romans 8, verses 12 through 17, um, says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. You, know, you know why I like that passage? Because I don't, you know, a lot of times when I'm worshiping God, I get the Holy Spirit goosebumps. <laughs> you know, especially when I hear the name of Jesus a lot. You know, especially in the music that, especially if I'm driving down the highway and I got my music cranking and the, and the, and the singer is singing the name of Jesus a lot and, or glorifying, praising God a lot, you know, and it's like, whoa, and I'm sucking in all the colors, you know, the sun and the, you know, the, 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 at night, the stars and the, the, the night and, and just looking at all of God's creation is like, this is awesome. This is an, ex this is a spiritual experience with Jesus, a, 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 a time of worship. Not, a, not just a time of praise, but a time of worship where my spirit and the Holy Spirit are crying, Oh, Abba, Father. And you know, what that, you know what that shows me? That I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And the cool thing about that is that means everything that Jesus owns is mine. And yours. Everyone who has the same spirit. It's ours. That's the cool thing. But guess what? Everything we have is His including our life, our careers, our homes, our money, our time, our love, belongs to Him. Peter says that we've been purchased. He, he owns us. Not with perishable gold and silver, but with the imperishable, precious blood of the Lamb. That's awesome. That's awesome. The Holy Spirit gives us confidence to walk by faith. And the Holy Spirit gives us the desire to be with Jesus. Let's, let's go back to 2 Corinthians verse 6. It says, For we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. We live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We, the believer in Jesus Christ, everything we do is by faith. And so, I, it, what bothers me is when I run into Christians who feel like they have to have some scientific piece of evidence to back up what their faith is. If you need that, then there's a problem there. there, there you're being short-circuited as to your confidence in God. Now, that doesn't mean that I disregard science. Not at all. You know, the Bible is very scientific in, in ways. Okay? There are scientific facts within the... But it's not... A textbook of science. And let's never forget that the wisdom of man is foolishness. I can prove it. We have people running around the planet saying there is no God. That's the most foolish thing you could ever say ever. Okay? Telling us that we're just an evolutionary random accident and that the way we should live is kill or be killed. You know, grab all the gusto that you can, get what you can, you know, take what you can, give nothing back. The pirate, the pirate code. God doesn't want us to be pirates. He wants us to be farmers. 
sowing good seed and reaping a harvest. He wants us to be ambassadors with a message of good news. He wants us to be kings and priests unto our God, leading the charge of people entering the kingdom of God and praying for them while we do so. He wants us to be the body of Christ. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, how dumb would it be if I decided, well, I'm mad at my thumb, so I'm going to take this here hammer and I'm going to smack that thumb because I think that thumb is stupid. It looks ugly and I don't like the way it looks and, and the, 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 you know, I don't like the color. Blah, blah, blah. That would be the dumbest thing in the world. But yet, how many times do we pound other members of the body of Christ with the hammer of our legalism? And then we wonder why we, why we, why we feel so defeated sometimes. Jesus said... John 13, 35, they, the world, will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. A love that does what? That is willing to lay down his or her life for his or her friends. I'll tell you something. I've been involved in some controversies where the Holy Spirit said, you need to take the hit on this and be quiet. He said that to Jesus, didn't he? What did Jesus deserve to get? Did he deserve to die on a cross? Did he deserve to have the nails pounded into his flesh? Did he deserve to be, to be humiliated and stripped naked in front of people as he died? Did he deserve to be, have his face pummeled so badly that he didn't even look human anymore? Did he do anything? To, he, no, he didn't. But he took the hits for us anyway. Amen. I think we need to be willing to take the hit for one another. I believe that success for our local body here is that. That we would have an attitude of be willing. Even if you think you're right and they're wrong, take the hit for them. Or, or, or better yet, how about let's just assume the best instead of always assuming the worst. I think it's our flesh that likes to assume the worst. How about we assume the best? That might be the way of taking the hit, you know, of us stepping up and, and being loving, you know. Love is not rude, does not demand its own way. The love of God compels us to preach the gospel. The love of God compels us to be willing to be martyred. The love of God compels us to be willing to be made fun of. There are times in my walk where, where people made fun of me because I was a Christian through my whole life. And, and, and I expected that because Jesus said, if they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. The world doesn't know me, though, so therefore the world's not going to know you. But he says, he says this, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see, I don't have to vindicate myself because I know that when Jesus comes back, I will be vindicated by Him. Amen. Vengeance is His, not mine, saith the Lord. I don't need to even the score on everyone who's gotten a, one up on me. Okay, Don't need to do that. Shouldn't do that. Should forgive and move on. Be willing to take the hit. Now, I know that's, that's not the easy part. See, this is, this is the tough part. This is the rubber meat in the road part. And I'm not here to say, I'm not here to condemn anyone. This is not a, a, a word of condemnation. It's a word of exhortation. That let us, let us walk in love. You know, let us love one another. Amen. And that will give us the right aim. Okay? Verse 9, 10, and 11 says, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. That's our aim, to please God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade, when, persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust we are well known in your conscience. See, see if, you, if you have a friendship with the judge, does that give you a bit of confidence? I want to remind you something. 
the defender and the judge of our condition is our best friend. Jesus Christ is both our judge and defender. Um, John writes that, we, that if we sin, we have an advocate, a defender, with the Father. Jesus Christ, the man. But Jesus is also our judge because we're going to stand before the Bema seat. So what is the Bema seat? Is it going to be a judgment of condemnation? No, it's going to be more like an awards assembly. This Christian led 15 people into the kingdom of God. Woohoo! You know, this Christian ta you know, taught faithfully for 35 years the word of God and never grumbled and complained. Woohoo! This Christian ran the race. And, and never gave up in spite of the fact that his entire family called him a, a, a dumb and, and stupid and, and, and so heavenly minded he's no earthly good. Woohoo! <laughs> it's going to be an awards assembly. Amen. So, how do we understand our destiny, obtain our sight? Acquire the aim, verse 12, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but we give opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance, not in heart. For, we, for if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if, Christ, if one died for all, then all died and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That should be our aim. To live for Jesus because he's the one that died for all. To be Lord of both the living and the dead. We found out last week, right? In Romans chapter 14. And so what's the, what, what is the final conclusion of, of, of our destiny, our sight, our aim? Well, let's continue to read on. In verse 16 it says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. For old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of condemnation? Or no, reconciliation. That this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we... Our ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. We Christians need to live our lives for Jesus because he died for us. Amen. We Christians have been given the word of reconciliation. Not the word of condemnation. The word of reconciliation. But I'm going to tell you something. I've been a Christian since I was 11 years old. I'm 55. I've walked with God for 44 years. And I'm and I, I, sad to say, I think I've heard more condemnation come out of Christians' mouths towards one another than reconciliation. Or even, even towards the world. And even from my own mouth. That's fleshly. We've got to crucify that. We're called to reconcile. Not divide, not, not punish, you know, not judge. You know what Paul said? Paul said, I don't even judge myself. I'm waiting for the Lord to come and judge me. I think we'd be safer that way. Because you know what? I can only see you one day at a time. And you might be having a real bad day, and I go, oh, well, yeah, brother so-and-so is my, what a colonel, colonel being that person is. And, and that's the only bad day they've had. And the rest of the month, they're loving Jesus and leading people into the kingdom of God. But that one day, they have a bad day. And I catch them in that bad day. And I'm thinking, oh, they're carnal. They're not of God. I don't, I'm not going to befriend them. I don't. That would be a mistake, wouldn't it? <laughs> because what was Christ's attitude towards us? But Christ demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet his enemies. He loved us. He saved us. Right? Amen. He did not... He did not consider our... Now you say, well, I, okay, well, what about people who willfully sin? 
All people willfully sin. The Bible is very clear about that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you know what? God knows who the saved are and who the unsaved are. Yeah, I, I, I like that. That has freed me. I don't need to figure out who the saved are and who the unsaved That's not my job. My job is to preach the gospel and let God sort it out. Because I know that God's word will not return void. If God's word draws you to Jesus and draws you to repentance and you, and you really want to change your life, and I'm not saying that, that we'll be perfect after this. It will be perfect in our spirit, but we still have things to work out. And I don't know why God has done that. It would have been so much easier if God would just save us and then rapture us individually. It would be a lot less messy. But there are things that God wants us to learn and to know and to go through. Why? Well, think about one of the places where we're going to be ministering. Do you realize, I believe we're going to be ministering to people without glorified bodies during the millennial kingdom. We who will have our glorified bodies will be able to tell the ones who are, are, are still in, their, in their, their earthly tent, hey, I used to be like you. I used to live on this planet. I used to have the doubts. I used to struggle with sin. But now look at me. Look at what, looky what I can do through Jesus. Right? Like Cornelius. Whoa, silver and gold. Right? Why? The bottom line is that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. Wow. That's the, that's the, that's the capstone of it all. He, God has made us the righteousness of Christ. I want you to know that if there's anything spiritual that we can boast in, we, it's only through Christ. Only through Jesus Christ. And I believe that we should boast in Christ. Give Him the glory. Give Him the praise. And, and live in such a way that people will see our lives and say, hmm, look at these Christians. How they love one another. Hmm. Look at these Christians. Look how much they love their God. That they're willing to go through difficult and tough times in order not to sully his name wouldn't that be cool if people outside would say to, about us look at those people they're the people of the word who also walk in the power of the Holy Spirit let's pray Lord I thank you that no matter how we fail you you don't you don't Throw us away. Those of us who have accepted you into our hearts, we are born again of God's Spirit. We are now forever part of the family of God. We have been saved to the uttermost. We can't be any more saved. But Lord, we can walk more in that salvation here on earth. So Lord, my prayer is that we would love, love, love one another and you Father, help us to forgive one another when we need to forgive. Help us to take the hit for one another when we need to do that to protect. Lord, help us to think the best of people. Love does not, does not keep a record of wrong. It, it, it erases it. it. It says, that's okay. I, I, I trust God. I believe. I believe it will be better this time. Lord, give us a spirit of faith, hope, and love faith that looks back to a crucified Savior. A spirit of love that looks up to a crowned Savior. And a spirit of hope that looks forward to a coming Savior. Because only we, the members of Jesus Christ and His church, truly have faith, love, and hope. Father, I pray for our church. I ask that you would, that you would grow us in our walk with you, in our closeness to you, in our numbers, Lord God in all aspects, in our integrity, in our love for one another, in our love for you. Lord, I, I pray for our president. I ask that you would draw him to yourself. Lord God, that you would make him godly. Lord, that, that, you would, that, you would, that he would find godly counsel. And, and also for our vice president, and that, that you would protect them from evil forces that would try to prevent them from being the leaders of this country that they're called to be. Lord God.
Father, I pray for Israel. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for Benjamin Netanyahu and his protection as the leader of Israel. Lord, you, your word says that if we bless the people, of the children of Abraham will be blessed. And, and Lord, it's not just that we want to be blessed. It's because we want to love those whom you love. And you have a special love for the, for the nation of Israel. Not that you don't love other countries, because you do, because you gave your one and only begotten son for all of us. And we thank you for that. Lord, I pray, God, that in, in 2018, that new and exciting things would occur within this body, that, that you would be glorified and exalted in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I, I don't know about you guys. I'm excited. I, can't, I, I think there's some good things coming our way. Amen. You know? And so I, this is my advice. Let's make our, our net bigger. <laughs> you know? Let's make our net bigger so that we can catch more of the blessing, you know, because uh, God is good. Um, if you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now. And if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus, accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week. And may God bless you all the days of your life.